good afternoon. Welcome, everybody, um, to today's event. Um, when Professor Eakley asked me to introduce this event, um, I told him I will do anything for him, um, but particularly this event. Um, I am such a big fan of the work of the Center for Corporate Law and Governance, and I think that um, the Center has just done tremendous work here um, at Rutgers, um, and in terms of uh, pushing, I think, really cutting-edge business uh, issues. And we just have, like, this outstanding faculty um, of, of, uh, of uh, business professors here that uh, work with the center and work with all of our students. Um, today's event is very uh, critical and very important, and I also think it's also very innovative. Sustainable supply chains strengthening the links looking at supply chains and issues of human rights and ethics and the role of corporations and corporate governance um, in addressing, I think, some really fundamental uh, human rights issues and, and, and ethical issues. Um, you all have the bios in the program, but I will uh, only start out by introducing um, our moderator, um, Dave Yaman, who is a very illustrious alum of uh, Rutgers, he's trying to be modest, but um, I, was a, I was a big fan when I first met him. He's a general counsel and corporate secretary of PepsiCo, executive vice president of government affairs. Um, he is a Rutgers Law School alum and very much engaged with both the corporate center and the corporate law school and very much in harmony, um, certainly with the history of the school, the legacy of the school, and the tremendous work that we're doing now. So let me turn it over to Dave. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Did you want Doug? Wanna yeah, I just wanted to no. say we Thank you, Dave. Thank you. I'm Doug Eakley, and I wanted to uh, welcome you on behalf of the uh, Rutgers Center for Corporate Law and Governance. Uh, we are being co-sponsored with the Rutgers Institute for Professional Education, and, and Josephine Nagel is over there. Uh, if you want credit, um, you, you should, uh, uh, CLA credit, you should see Josephine. Uh, after the conclusion of the program, we continue with informal discussion upstairs, just one flight upstairs for a, um, a reception, and hopefully you can all join us then. I have one addition to make to the bios uh, that, that is self-serving, but I'm going to do it anyway. One thing that's not mentioned about Dave Yeoman is that he is a member of the advisory board of the Rutgers Center for Corporate Law and Governance, and we're very proud uh, of our affiliation. Thank you, Dave. Awesome. Well, welcome, everybody, and uh, glad you could be here with us uh, today. Uh, we're going to talk about a topic today that I think uh, everybody's been impacted uh, by, I'm sure, over the course of your life, whether it was conscious or subconscious or whether you're aware of it or not, uh, the fact that we've had global supply chains is nothing new in the world of commerce, but uh, how much attention it's getting uh, these days uh, is really what's changed over the past you know, decade or so, uh, depending on uh, from, from your seat and what, you, what, uh, what your perspective is. Um, you know, for years and years, and probably for many decades, the key questions about supply chains was, what can I get? and how much does it cost? And how much of it do you have available, and when can I get it, and how much does it cost? Um, and those were the kind of the key questions, was what and how much? Uh, and I think the, the, the range of questions these days that are being asked about supply chains is the full panoply of who, what, why, where, what impact, uh, et cetera. And so the questions that are going on these days is uh, you know, what, from what part of the world, uh, did all the elements of your product come from, or did your product come from? From what uh, countries, from what areas within those countries? I need granular uh, tracking of where all elements of my uh, product are coming from. Uh, who did the work, and under what conditions were they working? Uh, what impact did the production of this uh, issue or the crop being sourced, what impact did that have on the environment? Um, there's a lot uh, of more questions being asked, uh, and ultimately there's a lot of, a uh, much broader set of constituents that are asking those questions. Uh, meanwhile, technology advancements have continued to impact not just human uh, lives, but business lives, and it impacts supply chains uh, as well. So when you think about information systems, tracking systems, satellite imagery of crops and farming uh, operations, uh, certainly the global media reach and even social media, 
uh, all those uh, technology advancements, frankly, are shining a much bright, brighter light uh, on all the elements of the supply chain um, and ultimately driving a thirst for answers to the questions and ultimately driving more questions, again, from a broader set of constituents. Uh, so ultimately, the beauty of technology is that it does create greater transparency. Transparency, uh, as you all know, Justice Brandeis's uh, legendary quote, sunlight is the greatest disinfectant. Ultimately, transparency le leads to uh, better standards, uh, better performance, uh, and it certainly has led to greater expectations relative to how companies and every element and level of the supply chain is operating. Uh, I would say that supply chains are more sustainable and, and healthier and stronger today than they were yesterday, uh, but there's still plenty of room to go. Uh, but the topic today is certainly relevant right now. It's very timely uh, right now. It's very impactful. I'm sure many of you have heard about it. Just uh, two things happened to me in the last 48 hours that were very relevant to this topic, and I wasn't looking for them. They, I just tripped on them. Uh, first, I was flipping a magazine at my breakfast table two days ago, and I came across this advertisement. It was a full-page advertisement in a fairly well-distributed magazine. Uh, there are still fairly well-distributed magazines in the world. Um, and it's from a group called Good Weave, uh, which uh, uh, are, I, didn't, I was not familiar with them, but they operate essentially to watch uh, over the, the very localized elements of the textile uh, supply chains that go into rug making. Uh, and they very much profess to be uh, on the watch for child labor uh, and to essentially expose and bring transparency to elements of child labor which I gather, and I do not know, are at the, you know, kind of the bottom rung of the supply chain within the rug market. And there's a symbol that they'll add if they certify, ultimately, uh, that, that uh, I'm assuming your rugs are, are made without uh, the use of child labor, uh, and it's a good weave symbol. So that happened to me just the other day. And, and literally last night, um, at about 9 o'clock, I actually got an email from our CEO, uh, who has just returned from uh, a sustainability summit uh, that one of our uh, strongest retail customers, thinking about us as a manufacturer of PepsiCo, we make food and beverage uh, products, we ultimately, our customers are the stores uh, on whose shelves our products appear, and one of our primary customers called a sustainability summit, called all the folks that were selling products in their stores to come meet with them and talk about sustainability uh, of their products, of their packaging, of their transport, and really pushing uh, a lot of elements uh, of sustainability uh, greenhouse gases, renewable energy within your fleets and our trucks, et cetera, uh, and also having a broader discussion about what frameworks exist to actually bring more tracking, recording, and ultimately a lot of that transparency to supply chains. And you, so you got somebody that in our world, uh, the retailer stands between our products and the consumer. All of you are consumers. Uh, you're a constituency. Our customers, those stores, are, uh, are, are a uh, constituency. Uh, we as a manufacturer who get things from suppliers are a constituent all in this supply chain, all of whom are asking questions uh, across the, the entirety of the supply chain. So that's what we're here to talk about today. And we have a great panel uh, to help us uh, with the discussion, uh, a couple of different perspectives. You have their bios in the material, so I won't, I won't uh, belabor uh, long introductions. But we have uh, from the Ruck Rutgers Business School, Kevin Colbin, uh, from the Rutgers Law School, Sarah Dadouche. Uh, and then two uh, corporate representatives from the apparel industry, uh, Nathan Fleissig, and from the food and beverage uh, industry, my colleague at PepsiCo, Jaron Dunning. Um, we hope to organize today's um, uh, conversation in two large parts. Uh, my guess is that, that that will probably collapse relatively quickly. Uh, but the main two uh, sections that we were trying to aim at were one, hey, who are the constituencies that are asking all these questions? What are this broader group? of folks that are asking a lot of questions and who are the, the stakeholders in questions about supply chains. And secondly, then what is the reaction to all those questions and all the stakeholders and the extra uh, change that they're driving? What is the actual uh, response to that change? So that's the tee up in the context. And, and maybe just to get, uh, get this started, um, you know, we at PepsiCo are a public company. Uh, and so I'll go to the, my far left and, and your far right to Jaron and just ask Jaron, maybe you can talk about what you're hearing from the investor population within, uh, you know, for public companies, uh, which historically I'm not sure has been a big constituency asking about supply chains, but maybe you can just address um, the investors. And, and perhaps just at the start before everybody on the panel makes uh, any comments, maybe just give a, a line or two about your role or area of your study or, or what have you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, thanks, Dave. Can everyone hear me? I, I know you're not that far away, but just making sure the mic's there. 
So as, as Dave mentioned, Darren Dunning from PepsiCo, I, I serve in really two different roles. So I wear two different hats. One is legal counsel, which is really helping the business identify and manage human rights risks from a legal perspective, and then also wear the hat of human rights director. And what my responsibility in that is, is really helping us define our global strategy around human rights and then seeing how can we embed that with our own business, but also as you think of our value chain. So, so a few concentric circles out, you think of our own operations, our supply chain, our broader value chain, which would fall into our business partners. So our joint ventures, our franchisees, and things like that. So that's a quick, a quick synopsis of my job. Happy to, to answer any questions after that. As we think about investors, and this is a group that I engage with a little bit in, in my current role, over the past five to seven years, the real focus within it, the investor community has been on the, the broader ESG framework, so environmental, social, and governance. The real focus there has been on the E and the G. Um, you really see those two being the easiest to quantify, the easiest to track. It's very easy to say we've saved X amount of money by reducing water or you know, being able to track what you're doing from a GHG perspective. Over the past two to three years, we've really seen an uptick in investors asking us about the S and really getting interested in what does the social component really bring to it. It's far, far more difficult to actually quantify some of those. You know, is it the amount of human rights abuses we found or the number of suppliers we found issues with? So what we've seen is really an uptick in the overall engagement. And this has largely been led by what we call SRIs or socially responsible investors. So these are typically smaller, um, you know, not managing in the billions, generally the, the several millions to, to tens of millions there. So it's really been a conversation we've had a lot there. And over the past probably three years, we've actually hosted a, or co-sponsored a conference on business and sustainable investment that has brought together the larger institutional investors. So when you think about that, that's your, your BlackRock, your APG, um, you, you know, your Morgan Stanley, who are managing, or Bain Capital, who are managing hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions. So what we started to see there is, is a slight shift to focus on the S, largely from a risk mitigation standpoint. Uh, I think it's, we've, we've actually had several conversations with some of our investors around how do you value the S or human rights. It, it's, a, it's a difficult part to do that. And that's something we've seen as the overall trend now that everyone seems, you know, largely aligned on the environmental aspects and how material they are to companies and the governance aspect has always been there. We've seen the social aspect really start to, to grow. And, and Kevin, amidst your much broader um, areas of study, uh, I know you spend at least some part of your time in uh, looking at kind of consumers and I even appeal to everybody here in the audience to think about kind of the consumer reaction. But from your perspective, uh, looking at um, at least one segment of what of some of the things that you look at from a consumer perspective, any commentary about how consumers are playing and creating pressure uh, on companies? Yeah, well, I think what's been interesting me is um, the role that consumers do play. Um, there's a question of practically how do you quantify the degree to which consumers put pressure on companies and, and take effect, but it has to be, in the end, some kind of pressure because companies wouldn't really do much if they didn't think it would affect the bottom line, and consumers, of course, are the end of the game in the bottom line. So I've been interested um, in some of my research recently from a legal perspective, because law also, except for people like Sarah Dadouche, don't really, that, that doesn't look very much at the role of consumers in governance. And um, the question I've been interested in is, how do we think about the ways in which consumers relate to the social questions that Jaron was talking about? Like, for example, um, you find, especially in younger consumers, a, a, a real growing desire to uh, feel good about the things that they're consuming. Clothing is one of the easiest ways to make that connection because what you put on your body is very much linked in to your identity. But even you know, we're so branded. If you have a Nike on your foot or a Nike swoosh on your foot or an Apple on your computer, you immediately identify with that. Um, and I've been curious about exploring, like, what is that exactly? Um, and so I really think uh, it's been, you know, there's, I have a number of ways that I can talk about. I don't know if you want to do that now or later, sort of how I conceptualize or think about the way in which we relate to our Consumers. stuff. Have at it. All right, well, one way I think that we think about it is that um, the way I think about things, I tend to think about things from an 
even though I'm a lawyer from an economics perspective, and think about the way in which our economy has changed very rapidly, in particular over the last 20, 30 years. And we've moved from an economy which now many decades ago, which was very integrated geographically, very local. When you went to buy something, chances are the person who made that was at least in your country, if not in your community. And as information technology has changed, transportation costs have gone down, average global tariffs have, have dropped to something like 3.5%, the economy has completely shifted to a supply chain economy. So now the person that makes our stuff is probably on the other side of the world. And I believe that that has had an effect on people, on us as consumers, about um, the way we relate to our things, but also the way we relate to the people who make it, and that there is an innate desire for us to actually be connected to the people who make our stuff. Um, and we engage in a kind of what I call consumer imaginary. When we think about, if we engage in this process of like uh, thinking about who is the person in the factory that created the zipper on our jacket, or who is the person that picked our coffee bean, when you start to engage in those questions and have a mental image in your head, which many people are increasingly doing, that is a kind of consumer imaginary. And you feel some kind of, you want to feel at least some kind of connection in that we've lost in the marketplace. And there's a role, businesses have been doing it, businesses realize that, and so for those that have a business plan that uh, try to focus on the S, um, it might have uh, you know, some kind of, uh, have a social business, then they do try to create those images in your head and that's part of their marketing plan. Clothing companies like Everlane come to mind that do that very much. You can go on their website and see pictures of the workers as such. Um, but there's also a role for the law to, I think, start to exploit in a good way that innate desire that consumers have to become less alienated from the stuff that we, we buy. So that's the kind of uh, issues that we can talk about more about and that I've been working sure. on. Sure, so you got, you got companies who historically were just trying to provide a good product at a good cost on the shelf so people could buy it, and if the product worked for you and you liked the product, you'd buy more of it. Uh, it's gotten more complex now. Investors are starting to ask you know, how um, you know, products are made and where did it come from, and certainly consumers are, which uh, to Kevin's point, is a major driver of any company uh, behavior. So now companies are more inclined to pitch a good story and tell a good story wrapped around their brands. Uh, that becomes part of their marketing. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen commercials or, or advertisements from company emphasizing something positive from an ESG perspective about their products. Sarah, is it true all the time that companies, uh, everything they say that's good about their products is always true? No, uh, it isn't. <laughs> Other uh, than at PepsiCo and outer stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Present company included. Uh, excluded. Uh, but, <laughs> yes, sorry. Apologies. Um, no, but it is, you know, building uh, very much on what, on what Kevin uh, was sharing with us. Um, I think consumers are both um, seeking out products that align with their values, their personal sort of sense of who they want to be in the world, what kinds of purchases they make has a connection to um, how true they are being to their own values. So one way in which consumers activate is around the choices that they make, very simply. Uh, but another way is through litigation. So in situations where consumers are disappointed uh, or harmed by realizing that a company made a promise about its social or indeed environmental performance that turned out to be false or broken or empty in some way um, that can make consumers very upset, upset enough to bring lawsuits. And so we've seen, um, well, studying back in the early 2000s, the sort of original uh, case in this regard was the Nike v. Caskey case, which uh, was a case brought against Nike by someone who had purchased Nike products uh, on the, some understanding that Nike was not using sweatshop labor. It turned out that that wasn't true. Uh, in in con contradicting some statements that Nike had made about its commitment to uh, protecting its workers in, in its uh, factories, particularly in Asia. 
so that's sort of like one of the door openers to holding companies accountable under consumer law uh, for, for making empty, what I call, virtuous promises. Um, and then we go fast forward uh, by about a decade, and we've had a string of cases brought by consumers against chocolate companies uh, for employing uh, forced child labor in the harvesting of cocoa, uh, but also against Costco uh, for selling shrimp uh, that was uh, fished by slave workers in Thailand, uh, and a few other cases. And they, um, Nike, the Nike case uh, succeeded, uh, but these other cases that I'm mentioning to you now have all failed. Uh, so some have made it past a motion to dismiss, uh, but by and large, the problem is that companies can sort of make these promises about doing good in the world um, and not keep them. And there is no real way to hold them accountable under consumer law as yet. So holding companies accountable for at least what they're saying out loud and how they're operating in their, in their supply chains is a bit of an open question. Uh, one of the things that comes to mind uh, for me and certainly uh, some of the folks that we hear from at PepsiCo and a lot of companies do are the, are the NGOs uh, of the world who are keeping close tabs and trying to hold uh, many layers of the supply chain accountable. Uh, Nathan, maybe over to you. Uh, you certainly, in your work with Outer Stuff, maybe give a quick uh, you know, top line note on kind of uh, your role there. Uh, but my guess is that you, you hear or interact with plenty of uh, NGOs in the work that you do. Yeah. <clears throat> Always difficult to follow somebody from a legal point of view who keeps bringing up Nike. We're a manufacturer of Nike, so you're not wrong. <laughs> and, and it is good to see a D-Way jersey in the back. <laughs> my company made that around eight, ten years ago, actually, <laughs> when it was back at Adidas and not with Nike. That. And I can tell you, actually, by supply chain management, is based on the labels that are in that product. I could tell you exactly the factory that made it, the month and year it was manufactured, and everything about it. So that's sort of part of what you were talking about in supply chain management mm -hmm. and transparency. But um, nice to see that in there. And we are, we are a licensee of Nike. Um, I'm the director of corporate social responsibility at Outer Stuff. We have our licensees that include Nike and a Adidas and NFL, NBA, NHL, all the leagues, uh, as well as all the universities. We make product that is shipped right here to the Rutgers um, bookstore. Um, just a few comments. You were talking about reading something just the other day in the news, Patagonia. Any of you who purchased Patagonia has made a statement that they're reevaluating their suppliers. They're only going to be working with you know, sustainable um, suppliers. Um, those of you who have Apple products, OK, how many have Apple products? Right. Did you know that there's been almost 20 suicides in suppliers by Apple over the years? Right. So if you go on their website, right next to their best-selling product of the earbuds, they actually now put their sustainability um, link right into their su sustainability supply chain and what they're doing. So, um, you know, things, things are changing. As for the, uh, the retailers and the brands, you know, who is it that's moving the needle? Um, you know, my opinion, being in supply chain management for 35 years and being in the human rights, it's actually been the retailers and the brands, believe it or not, that are moving the needle in overseas supply chain. It is not the governments of the U.S. It is not the governments of the local countries. Okay, one good example is the Bangladesh Accord and the Bangladesh Alliance, which the Bangladesh government and the BGMA didn't even want. Okay, so you know needles are moving a little bit here, and you know um, I, I know what you're talking about for Nike. I know all those cases, but honestly, um, uh, the NGO community says if you are a sewer, your best bet for a decent life is to work in a supply chain and factory for U.S. brands and licenses. That's your best bet, actually, rather than a below-the-line, non-transparent supply chain. So I think the brands and the retailers are doing a, um, a better job. Uh, just very quickly on a quick story, seven years ago, it's a Friday afternoon, it's about four o'clock, um, and right on the news, on the, on the internet, and 
internet's blowing up, everything's blowing up, that one of our factories in El Salvador that does our Adidas work and all our university work uh, is in the news um, about poor working conditions. One of the NGOs, the Workers' Rights Consortium, you can look it up, WRC, you can put in Outer Stuff's name and you'll be able to read the report, it's public. And we were all over the news. So I had phone calls from all the universities, from all the leagues, what's going on. So I go into my boss, he's Orthodox Jewish. He says, well, I said, I gotta tell you something. He says, walk with me. We go down to the elevator and literally between the lobby and the 18th floor, I had to tell him exactly what was going on. He says, I gotta go, keep me updated. Well, updated in Orthodox community is not the next day from Shabbos, it's 24 hours. So <clears throat> all the, uh, all, all our licensors, all the universities, NBA, NFL, all the leagues, everybody is contacting, trying to contact my owner. He's orthodox. He doesn't pick up the phone. He doesn't read email. Nothing to be done. Well, I'm listed on our website as next, but they kept, all the vice presidents kept calling him. Anyway, so I'm on the phone that night with the Hong Kong office of Adidas and everybody. I have to draft a letter to the NGO community and or our licensors about what's going on in this factory. Takes me all night. Um, I write it up. All my licensors say, okay, publish. I said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. What do you mean you can't do that? I'm sorry, my owner is orthodox and he needs to sign off on this letter and I can't put this on our website. I can't tell you the leagues anything about it. So I actually can't do anything. The next day, I take my son. We go see uh, a movie, the Brad Pitt baseball movie. Um, Moneyball. Moneyball. We come out of the movie theater. This is now around 7 o'clock at night. And I'm getting phone calls, messages from all the VPs of all the leagues. What is going on? What is going on? What is going on? The universities are calling me. The leagues are calling me. Uh, the NGOs, the WRC is calling me. What's going on? And I'm walking home with my son. He says, Dad, this is the coolest thing. The <laughs> vice president of all these leagues are calling you? I'm like, dude. He's like, I don't know, 10 years old. He's like, dude. I'm like, dude, this is not a good thing when the vice presidents of all these leagues call you. And the WRC, and, and this is a true story. So finally, my boss opens up his email at 7 p.m. Shabbos is over. He looks at probably hundreds of emails from everybody. He calls me up. He said, what is going on? I said, just read my statement. You need to allow me to read the statement. He reads my statement. I'm walking home. He's reading my statement. Fine. Release it. It's on our website. I send it right to all the universities, right to the leagues, right to the WRC, and a response. This is a true story about what a company in supply chain has to think on your feet on how do you respond from so many stakeholders. Also, by the way, we're owned 50% by Blackstone mm -hmm. Financial they were a little concerned as well, okay? So we have to think on our feet and how we work with many stakeholders. And, you know, we're a lightning rod. Like Pepsi is a lightning rod in certain ESNG areas. Nikes, Adidas, the universities, the leagues, these are lightning rods. It's outer stuff isn't the lightning rod. We're just the one that made it. The lightning rod, out of stuff doesn't mean anything in the news, but when you put all those brands in the news, that's the lightning rod. My job is to protect the brands at all costs. And that means traveling to all these factories around the world, accumulating a lot of frequent flyer miles to go away on vacation this summer to Italy for all four of us, but that's our job, protect the brand and know your supply chain. The big thing here is that Nike doesn't own any factories. Adidas doesn't own factories. Outer Stuff doesn't own factories. Nobody does. The fact is, is that we make up less than 1% capacity and leverage in a factory. So when something happens, mm -hmm. it's difficult for an Outer Stuff to move the needle. And the brands get to say, we don't own the factory. That's what we ask you to do. We ask, we ask you to manage it. So that's why some of the uh, cracks. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you. You, know, you, made, you raised the, you know, it's an interesting comment to say outer stuff just makes the, just makes it. Um, but your point, I think, at the top of that was, hey, manufacturers who have brands out there that are what the consumer interacts with are really the, the truly vested party in this because the value of their brand is now impacted by 
just the folks that make it and how it's made. Investors, to your point about Blackstone, worried about the value of their investment. Certainly investors at, at PepsiCo. So N NGOs, not unlike the plaintiff's bar, trying to hold companies accountable. NGOs pushing companies to look deeper and deeper to avoid the crisis moments to making sure that proactively you're addressing it. And so, Jaron, I, I look to you as, as somebody that's not in the apparel industry, but somebody that's in the food and beverage industry. Um, you know, what type of interactions do you have with the NGOs? Uh, and and what, what do you do both if there's reactive example, but is there also a proactive uh, example, which I don't think was ever part of the corporate playbook before, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's part of the increasing playbook, you know, now are the, the, the normal operations of a company. Yeah, I can completely sympathize with that. And I, I think you definitely want to avoid the crisis moment. So actually my first two years at PepsiCo, I was part of our public policy and government affairs team. It was actually that first line of defense or offense, depending on what you're, how, how you like to think about it, of engaging with external stakeholders. And that really runs the gamut of you know, your traditional um, NGOs, your advocacy-based groups, your campaigning groups, um, traditional um, employee associations like unions. And I think for us, and one thing we did, so I, I was really focused on some of our environmental and social issues, you become a true expert and you become the first, really the first person to tell your story and to be authentic about where you are and where you're not and what you're trying to do. I think that's been very important for us to have that level of trust. Because if you don't have that, you will have the campaigns, you will have other things. And I think civil society plays a very important part in keeping us honest. And for us and people who are in those roles, it's being able to translate that um, a bit sometimes from your external stakeholders to your internal stakeholders. Uh, actually, on these two or three issues, we're, we need to go a bit further than what we think we do. And at certain times, being a, that line that pushes back is actually, we're industry leading, we're, we're doing these things, and we're going to stay here for now. Um, and it, I think with that, it's definitely, a, a, it's definitely funner to be on the proactive side <laughs> versus the reactionary side of when I need to send Dave emails about things that are not going so well. Um, I, honestly, I think it's about the trust and what I've seen in relationships where you can hopefully avoid some of those things. Um, and I think we'll get onto it a little bit later around transparency and how that can actually be a useful tool to, to communicate what you're doing, where problems are that you realize that you have problems. Nine times out of 10, if a company says we have none of this in our supply chain, they're not being fully honest with you. I, I couldn't sit here today and say we have zero of this because we may have done the audit yesterday, today's a new day. Mm -hmm. Things may be different. Um, and one question we, we got onto I think is really interesting, and Nathan, the, the example you were giving, and I would love to get our, our academic um, friends, your, your take on this, of the role of a brand, I think through the lens of the UN guiding principles who, who kind of, to, to break it down, is you know companies have a responsibility to respect, governments to protect, and all of us to provide or enable remedy. I think in some of these examples, Nike was the brand who is using its leverage to say, hey, what's going on here, and how do you use that? So I love it. just thinking of the two examples you guys gave of how you see the role, particularly thinking through what's, what's being yeah, discussed. Yeah, we'll, we'll jump to standards, because you mentioned the UN yeah. guiding principles, which we'll get to in a second. But other, other thoughts about what is driving the change? Who are the forces that are actually propelling companies to do better. You referenced the plaintiff's bar, we're hearing about NGOs, but do you have perspective or other perspectives that are different or the same or consistent or? I mean, I would put a little more emphasis on uh, governments are doing something in that there are initiatives in places through corporate transparency laws where right now they're weak uh, relatively, but they're nudges in the right direction and I think we can nudge much further in transparency and also through trade law. Um, you know, we can, we can amend trade law, but trade law fundamentally is this, the, the, there are now labor provisions and environmental provisions in all the trade agreements that the United States enters into. And for that matter, the large majority of trade agreements signed in the world today, even between actors in the South that you wouldn't expect, have some mention of labor and environmental standards. I mean, they vary greatly. But it means that governments are paying attention to this. And what they largely are are essentially supply chain regulation initiatives. Right? Because when the United States enters into a trade agreement with a partner, largely 80% of international trade is supply chain trade. 
So that's what we're talking about. So um, we can have a much larger conversation about how those labor provisions should be crafted, but governments are doing something and thinking about it. Um, and what the role of, of the brands are, the lead firms, or as my colleagues in the supply chain department like to say, all the, the uh, downstream firms, mm -hmm. like what their, um, what their role is in that, that that's you know, part of what we have to discuss. And Sarah, any, any, any? I might just add um, also the uh, big brands employees. Uh, mm -hmm. I think yeah, my sense is that more and more people are wanting to work for companies that they feel proud of. Uh, proud to be working for, uh, feel values aligned with. So I think that's another uh, driver. And I was actually curious to know if in this uh, this whole story, if there was any reaction from the employees' concerns expressed by the by the employees of uh, of outer stuff. Um, and just a last group to add. Uh, to the sort of you know driver drivers of change, it's it's connected to the uh, the NGO space, but different um, is the the industry associations. Mm -hmm. uh, so groupings of of companies working in various industries, be it apparel or you know beverages or uh, I don't know. Electronics, yeah, all things that have uh, global supply chains backing them um, or involved and the issues, the human rights issues that come along with that. Um, industry associations are also sort of important standard setters in this space. Yeah, I always think of industry associations as, um, as ultimately kind of an aggregation of common interests across, you know, com what are competitors in the marketplace, but in, you know, as part of it, essentially trying to regulate a, a common framework against all competitors who are operating. There are times where industry groups want a, 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 stand, a set of standards that everybody's going to comply with that is both responsive to a consumer, a regulatory threat, a consumer demand, or, or some other just ethical practice. Uh, but to the extent that you're in a competitive marketplace and you're holding yourself to a higher standard and others aren't, which is a typical situation in many parts of the world, it creates a competitive imbalance, and that's, uh, that's not always the best thing uh, for commerce uh, um, either. Um, maybe anybody, a quick comment just as we think again about drivers of change. The role of social networks, media, uh, the flow of information, the, how things can go viral uh, like that, and the, the impact that that has had on propelling more change, more transparency. Anybody? Um, well, I don't think that in my world of, of apparel, um, there's nothing bigger than the Rana Plaza collapse of a factory in Dhaka, you know, five and a half years ago, where a lot of, you know, thousands of people died. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, so you want to talk about social, social media. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as that happened, that was global. That was social. Um, that's probably the biggest that that I've come across in, in my 35 years working. And uh, what happened is, you know, there were some organizations that evolved out of that. The Bangladesh Accord, mostly for EU brands. We're a member of, we're actually a, we're a member and a signator of the Bangladesh Accord, the, yeah, the, the, Ali the Bangladesh Alliance, which were U.S. brands and retailers signed on to that to do things there. So I think, you know, that was a really good case where the social media part really took on a global effect and for um, all different people and organizations and coalitions to get together um, to do something about it. Unfortunately, you know, it's it expired. So what are the next steps in Bangladesh? Um, you know, I, I do agree to a point that there are um, the needle is moving with government. I mean, we know we have the UK Modern Slavery Act. We have California SB 657. We have the conflict minerals. Uh, all these are great, you know, really great things in the industry. Um, you know, in my industry of apparel, it really comes down to the workers and the hours and the age and, the, and, and all these things. And from a, a legal point of view, we're just not there yet. Example, you could, you could work 100 hours a week as a 14-year-old in Bangladesh, by the way. It's legal. It's absolutely legal six days a week. 
you could be 14, 15 years old. That's actually legal. So check your garments if you have, if you have anything made in Bangladesh. Okay? We here in the U.S., we have codes of conduct okay, that most retailers and brands live by. But you have the supply chain community pushing back by saying, it's legal in my country. Stop telling me what to do. You want your product at the prices you're talking about. We call that in our industry, we call that a race to the bottom. I'm sure you've heard that term before. A race to the bottom to get those products at those prices. Mm -hmm. And when local factories and local governments are telling you it's legal for 15-year-olds to work 100 hours a week, one day off, and you're telling them that, I'm sorry, Adidas tells me you can only work 60 hours a week, okay? There's that struggle with supply chain all the time. And how do you meet price? If, you, if you're going to tell the supply chain, you can only work 60 hours a week. But here I am at Outer Stuff trying to buy a product. You know, it, it's a very difficult um, situation. And there are, j just to answer your question, there are coalitions. I belong to the Fair Labor Association. In the apparel and footwear industry, we have the Fair Labor Association, where competitors, I sit at the same table with competitors all the time. But we work on uh, living wage. We've been trying to get a living wage into our supply chain, okay? Um, the Sustainable Apparel Coalition is another group of companies that are competitors trying to get to the standards that uh, we all want to get to. Um, so again, I think the, it's the retailers and the brands moving the needle more than actual government. All right, and I don't know what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Is it the price? Is it the shareholder price? Is it, I don't know what comes first, you know, but um, we, we hope that we have government getting, getting more involved. We all want to buy product made in the right conditions. We all want that. It's an interesting dynamic because uh, I think the pressure, when you think about a supply chain from top to bottom, the, maybe call it the consumer on the top and the, the most local of uh, farmer or uh, a textile worker or what have you at the bottom uh, of the supply chain, um, the pressure is really coming from top down. Um, and, and there may be other forces on the top players of that supply chain, whether it's NGO pressure, it could be government pressure, it's certainly consumer pressure, uh, but there is resistance that also comes up from the bottom. Um, to some extent, and, and kind of hunting for price and trying to maintain norms, and if you and a lot of uh, the integration of an international supply chain makes it difficult because cultural and legal norms in many countries around the globe, uh, as Nathan was saying, are very different. Uh, and there are governments that literally enjoy and benefit from the economic activity, I think lower in the supply chain at a local level, uh, regardless of some of the norms or requirements. Um, so there's a lot of, there's pressure coming from the bottom or from the top down, um, but trying to get the entirety of the supply chain and frankly being able to track uh, the supply chain all the way to the bottom can be difficult in some ways too. But let's flip from the pressure that are on the top and talk about, all right, so what's that translating into? Um, we talked about how governments are getting into the game a little bit, perhaps from a transparency perspective, but perhaps not regulatory, and if some governments are, other governments aren't. You referenced, Kevin, the trade agreements. Where are we in terms of kind of hard law right now that would dictate behaviors, whether transparency or performance, or, or is there, you have a commentary at all about kind of where that sits and do we need more? You and mean, then I'll, then I'll flip down to the kind of UN guiding principles. You mean dictate behavior extraterritorially? Extraterritorially. Right. Yeah. There, through a, through an integrated not, global supply chain. There, there, Is that possible? <laughs> Dream of the day. Um, there is not really much. The, obviously, the litigation efforts to use existing laws like the Alien Tort Claims Act have mm -hmm. been slammed down. Yeah. Um, and we have a tradition in labor law in general in the, in, in the United States also not to regu regulate um, extraterritorially. Mm -hmm. So uh, there would be a lot of hurdles there. I'm not even sure how beneficial that would be. Um, in part because what are we regulating exactly? There's a lot of diversity in, in what we're trying to address down the supply chain. Um, so it would, be, it would be a challenge. Uh, I think a lot of people are thinking about it. Um, but it's not, you know, the tort liability path has not gone not very happen. far. And um, 
you know, the jurisdictional restraints of what you can actually have authority over is another constraint, especially since, as you know, Nathan said, Nike and outer stuff doesn't make Nike stuff, right? You're, no, you're licensed to ask someone else to, to make their but, stuff. But we're responsible for protecting workers. Right, mm -hmm. so that's that's the difficult. But you're not part. legally responsible. You're market responsible. No, no, we are legally. Our licensing agreement with contractually. Nike, I should say contract. Contra you're contractually, yes, contractually responsible we, with Nike. Correct. Right. Contractually, mm -hmm. uh, my wife, who's a lawyer, would tell me there's a difference. Um, okay. Contractually, you say the distinction between a kind of a regulatory obligation right. and right. Exactly. a contractual. It's not an employment law right. question. Right. It's a contractual. Yeah. Correct. Question. That's yeah. just contractually right. Right. Um, but again, like you don't. I mean, you, on your your sheet, you have what two hundred and. 67, how was it? How many? 250 employees? Right, so none of them are working in the factories. So you, you're not, um, you don't make stuff, right? And we have an economy now where the, the, license, the licensees, the licensors, none of them make stuff. Um, and so obviously the regulatory reach is very difficult. So the way that the US government and France and Britain have been moving is through forced disclosure, mm -hmm. hoping to generate some processes of mobilizing consumers and other stakeholders, including NGOs, uh, other institutions, to put pressure somehow on, on lead firms to, to take action. So you have in the United States, the California Transparency Supply Chain Act, which you even mentioned, and you have Dodd-Frank, which is around conflict minerals. Um, th there are, and there's, there's been efforts in Congress to actually nationalize the California um, law, and that hasn't gone anywhere, not shockingly, um, but that's out there and it keeps getting it reintroduced. Um, and so I think that's an interesting avenue for us to think about what should be disclosed and what form should be disclosed. In my fantasy land, you look at the consumer imaginary and have much more explicit information about what's going on in a specific company's supply chain and create channels of communication mm -hmm. between producers and consumers to reduce social distance. Yeah. Um, so that's... So that's disclosure right. rules have come out there with the hope that people read them and ultimately consumers um, right. and, and look at the, notice the information and bake that into their buying habits and so that would ultimately put pressure on the top of the supply chain to drive change into the supply chain. And then my mind goes to our... So, um, so faced with some of that and disclosing, and people may or may not read that, and the consumers increasingly are, but maybe they're not already there, there are, there are at least some, nor some standards uh, out there. And Jaren, you referenced the UN Guiding Principles. Uh, perhaps just a little more illumination for folks here as to kind of what they are and, and what, what impact do you think they've had um, you know, within the kind of the, the marketplace on companies? Yeah, and, and so the UN Guiding Principles were developed, and I think they were officially published in 2011, so still relatively new um, in, in the grand scheme of international law and still being soft law there, so their, their recommendations. But they really outline the responsibilities for governments, for corporations, and from two different aspects. So really outlining that governments have a responsibility to protect human rights, so that's establishing the laws that should protect either its labor rights or, or anything that would fall into that category and outlining that businesses have a responsibility to respect. And in essence, that means do no harm. So making sure that as you run your business, you're not infringing on those rights that the state has a responsibility to uphold and to protect. So th those are kind of the two pillars, and the last pillar, or, pillar is remedy. So when something has happened, um, companies have a responsibility to provide a remedy anytime we've caused or contributed to a human rights violation or a human rights abuse. Anytime we're directly linked to it, the responsibility really falls on us to use our leverage to make sure if it's deeper in our supply chain that we're driving remedy to whoever's been harmed. So kind of taking both of those, so actually within the UN now, there's a push to codify the UN guiding principles in an international treaty. And this is something that's been going on for about six years now, it kind of ebbs and flows. And right now, Ecuador has taken up the, the kind of lead uh, pushing that forward, and I think this gets to the point we were discussing a little bit earlier um, as we think about what would establish legal liability. So some of the provisions within this treaty would actually give um, the right for litigants in external, uh, outside the U.S. to sue. Um, basically the companies within the U.S. So PepsiCo, in theory, could be sued for a supply chain actor's actions in Mexico. 
uh, where currently that's, that's not really something that's been established um, by the plaintiff's bar. So with that, we're, we're starting to see a, a push, and I think with the, the transparency laws on what is the role of, of companies and what is the role of government, I, I think sometimes government isn't as much at the table as they probably should be in these conversations. Any times we're, we're engaging with external stakeholders or in a multi-stakeholder you know, uh, initiative, which is the, the hot term, anytime you're going to try and do something in a local company, government's typically missing. Uh, for a lot of the reasons Dave has mentioned, they still want to be a place that can attract business. They don't want the increased media attention. So those have been some of the things we've we've seen as you know the UN, UN guiding principles have really found their legs six or, or about eight years in, um, and now you're starting to see a push to codify them as as hard law. So beyond um, intra jurisdictional laws, I'm not hearing a lot of hard law that exists today. Uh, and to Kevin's point, hard to think extraterritorial. Maybe there's some maybe there's some news coming in, in that regard. Um, Sarah, I know you've looked some uh, some at, at some model, uh, and, and Nathan referenced a contractual requirement, kind of within the supply chain, uh, as to obligations they have. And I know you've done some work looking at certain contract clauses or model contract clauses that, again, try to advance the bar or advance the ball rather mm -hmm. in the absence of hard law. Yeah. yeah. So I, um, I teach contracts, uh, so I like them very much. <laughs> and, uh, and one of the things that I like about them in particular is that they overcome uh, jurisdictional uh, boundaries, right? They, can, they cross borders where, where hard law doesn't, contracts do. Um, and, uh, and the American Bar Association, the ABA, uh, recently created uh, a working group uh, to the, out of the business law section of the ABA. And the task of this working group was to draft uh, model contract clauses that U.S. buyer companies like The Gap or Hershey or uh, Nike could insert into their contracts with uh, suppliers. And the suppliers that they have in mind are uh, entities like factories, primarily based in developing countries, right? That's who they're thinking of. And the idea of these model contract clauses is that they would serve to advance the protection of human rights uh, within the supply chain and make the supply chain uh, more sound with respect to the protection of human rights. Um, and the way that they do that is uh, the primary sort of uh, device of the, of the model contract clauses, which I'll just refer to as the MCC, is that they take the, as Nathan was saying, like m many US buyer companies, especially the big ones, will have on their books a human rights policy or some supplier code of conduct, some commitment that they make to the UN guiding principles or something of this kind. Um, and what the MCCs ask of the buyers to do is to take that policy, which is a voluntary, pretty airy document, and attach it as an appendix to the supply agreement. This is like an incredibly simple, but also incredibly elegant solution to making companies' human rights policies enforceable via contract. Um, and so they, uh, and. So this is one really uh, beneficial uh, contribution that the ABA's initiative is making to the business and human rights space. Uh, another really beneficial contribution is that by making the human rights policy an appendix, um, the, the uh, ABA is effectively recommending uh, that we think about product conformity not just in terms of its, you know, physical or design specificities, you know, or even like quantity, how many t-shirts are according to what design. Uh, so we think about product conformity in terms of these sort of technical specifications, but we also think about product conformity in terms of the process by which the product was made, right, which is coming to the new questions that people are asking, not just, what and for how much, but also tell me something about the history of this product. Tell me something about how it came to market um, in the first place. 
So by this very simple technique of adding the human rights policy to, um, to the supply agreement, uh, the, this initiative is doing quite a lot of work, uh, at once making these sort of soft, airy human rights policies hard through contract and also kind of shifting our notion of conformity to be bigger uh, than just product specificity um, and to reach process. Um, so I think the world of this initiative, and, uh, but I also have serious problems with it. And um, my, my fundamental problem with it is that it, um, it shifts, the MCCs shift all responsibility for human rights violations uh, occurring in the supply chain onto the supplier. So it is the, the contract <clears throat> is basically being used as a vehicle to completely shield uh, the buyer company for liability for, so for human rights violations happening at, uh, you know, at, the, at the factory level, for example. Um, and that I, I view as a, as a real problem in large part because how the buyer engages with its suppliers, you know, on how, mu how much notice uh, a buyer gives its supplier that its order is about to change or its quantity requirements are about to change, uh, you know, how hard it negotiates to get the cheapest price uh, as opposed to a price that would allow the supplier to conform with human rights obligations. All of these purchasing practices have a real impact on how um, how well the supplier can do at respecting human rights. Mm -hmm. So uh, my, I, I like a lot of things about this initiative, and I should say, uh, I, because of my criticism, uh, both con positive and negative, uh, of, I've, been, I've been invited to now be on the working group uh, <laughs> of, of the ABA, and I'm now part of the discussions for uh, a version 2.0 of these model contractual. Con con yeah. Contractual pushdown of responsibility. <laughs> Nathan. Yes. Uh, Maybe now I have into some insight on why I've been called to Nike headquarters on Monday. I'm flying out. <laughs> I wonder if it has anything to do to do with that. Um, yeah, I mean, if it's a all, model contract provision, you should probably blame Sarah. <laughs> no, listen. Point. All all this is is really good to hear because uh, it, it is quite important. You know, I dig down to the worker. Uh, to me, everything is worker. I travel half the year to factories around the world. Um, and, and I'm with workers, I'm with unions, I'm with NGOs, I'm with more, I'm working in, I do worker engagement, pilots and training. So, you know, we hope that all of this trickles down to the worker. That, that, that's the point of all this. Uh, just one final note on the NGO uh, government type of thing. Uh, it was really great to see that the impact of NGOs actually did change government law. I mean, we talk about years ago uh, when a lot of brands were making goods in Myanmar, in Burma, for, for many years, where, where the, the conditions and the human rights violations are constant. So years ago, the US government and the EU said, you know what, we're not accepting any goods from those countries. So those factories all closed down, the workers were out of work, and that's a whole nother topic. But until their human rights violations began to reach a level, so the EU came back on board earlier than the US. The US still was not convinced. But this, you know, now we're back into Burma. So you have companies like PBH and Gap and Adidas going back in there. But we still hear human rights violations going on in that country. But just the, the, the point about uh, NGOs and CSOs and, uh, making a point to government, to the EU and to the US about closing down that country until better things could happen. I think that was a really good example where, you know, the tripartite of those, you know, all of them came together. Now they're back open again and my boss wants me to go find suppliers in that country. And I said, well, then you will have to find a new CSR director mm -hmm. because I'm not working for, for the company if, you, if this is an, an area where you actually want to go into. So, um, you know, th th that's, that's a challenge. But it is a good example of NGO and government uh, working. Now, if, uh, factories in that country uh, go through um, uh, the World Bank. They go through NGOs. There's a lot, the, the steps involved to be able to manufacture and export out of there goes a lot deeper than finding four walls, 500 sewers, 
and making product. It, it, you know, there's a right, lot so more you, hurdles. So you have this supply chain where the top of the supply chain is putting more pressure lower down, whether contractually um, or certainly just from a business pressure perspective. Uh, no manufacturer or retailer wants the crisis that you dealt with on a Friday night or a situation where they're getting hundreds of calls from other folks that they're business connected with. That I think motivates everybody that's a manufacturer or retailer, a uh, retailer or a manufacturer to look as best they can into deeper into their supply chain to make sure that the folks that they're starting to rely upon build business. It, it's hard and it's disruptive to a business to change out certain suppliers. Certainly if you have a magnitude of business or if it's a relatively hard to get item, uh, if you have to excise that supplier from your, your supply chain for some reason, whether very quickly or because of performance uh, along any of these lines. So what are, what are, what are companies doing relative to, to diligence? And are there, are there legal requirements around diligence? There are, there are some transparency laws which helps say, hey, what are you doing about this or have you looked? Some of that gets into what companies have to do to go take a look and to go look deeper and not go ostrich in the ostrich head in the sand relative to the rest of the supply chain. So any comment about either the requirements of diligence uh, that anybody's familiar with or practically uh, your frequent flyer miles are, are presumably in, in, in part because you're checking up or looking into other retailers or other suppliers rather. But any, any thoughts about kind of the diligence process or taking a magnifying glass a little bit to your supply chain? Yeah, I mean, the vetting process, uh, like Pepsi, you have a you know, very structured vetting process for all your suppliers. You have thousands and thousands of suppliers. You know, out of stuff, we have 100 factories. That's only a tier one, meaning the factory that sells the product. But there's, uh, you know, the textiles, there's the screen printing and the embroidery and the bit and the, you know, the buttons and the zippers and the lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, there's so many different levels and so many different tiers. You know, we've had to come up. We, one thing, it took me about a year, 18 months to develop a, a real vetting process. You know, we don't want to... Um, we don't want to overflow a factory where they get what we call in the industry audit fatigue, where every brand and every retailer every three weeks is going into a factory to do a social and environmental audit. That's audit fatigue. That doesn't help anybody. So, you know, we have a vetting process in my company. Understand that we have licensors like Nike and Adi, but then we also make for the NFL a non-Nike product where we sell it maybe to a Walmart or a Kohl's because they can't afford the licensing fees and the royalties and all of that. So we can make an NFL product with the Nike Swish. We can make an NFL product with just an NFL logo. That's going to go through two different, complete different supply chains. Mm -hmm. Those supply chains are completely different and they're vetted completely different. We've had to create a vetting process working with, um, working with competitors who are in that factory who have a long history of auditing um, where I don't want to audit if they've already done it. So um, the vetting process, it, it takes a while. If you want to be a new supplier in my company at Outer Stuff for a non-Nike or non-Adi product, it takes you a while. I'm going to get frequent flyer miles. It's going to take you a while to get the first purchase orders. Okay, but we only upload probably half a dozen new suppliers a year. No more than that, all right? No more than that. You know, when I hit the ground in these fat, my sourcing manager can come back and say, oh my God, Nathan, I was just at the best factory. It is so clean. It is so nice. We got to be able to make goods there. I mean, you know, he's showing me pictures and blah, you know. I'm like, all right, just give it to me. So we start our vetting process. Kevin's done. So I, I, want, I just want to, so I want to yeah. ask, you know, we talk, we, we're, we've sort of taken for granted this is our business model. Yeah. So what prevents you, what prevents PepsiCo from getting vertically integrated and just saying, we're going to own this and we're going to have a big, big factory in name your country and we're going to run it the way we want to run it. We're going to maybe charge a slight premium, but in return, you get a guarantee Nike and everyone else that you are not going to get burned in our factory. Hey. You ever, anybody eaten a potato chip? 
from potato, from farm yeah, it, to it, shelf. Go ahead. I'm we, it, it really Wait. depends yeah. on the supply chain. Sometimes there, we were talking about this earlier where from, so for some of our core commodities, so potatoes, citrus, corn, um, as you think about our product portfolio, PepsiCo is a, a large company. You may think of just Pepsi, but please think of the, the entire snack food um, side of it as well. But we actually do buy directly from farmers. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really from farm into our own plants, onto a shelf. We own the distribution in a lot of places as well. I think the complexity of why that's not the same in every single country really comes into play with the flexibility you need, um, the cost models in that country. Um, barriers to entry sometimes. There are certain countries where you can't just go and buy a plant. You need to have, you know, there are certain countries where it has to be a certain amount of government owned. Mm -hmm. That's just the, the, the complexities of doing business. And I think with that, that's why you see the due diligence processes come about. So we have very similar processes for our own operations that do audits, very similar to what Nathan was describing for our, our tier one suppliers, for our farmers that go through a very similar process. And I think that's why it's important to have the contractual obligation. But we were, we were chatting earlier, once you're working with a supplier or business partner and you get to talking about the contract, typically things are not in great shape. Um, mm -hmm. You're not working with a supplier who's a willing partner. Um, so the few times I've ever been involved in that, we've had to let a supplier go um, because of something in a country that was legal there, but not with not meeting our own standards. Mm -hmm. And that's where you, you have to get in. Um, I, we, we, we approach it through a continuous improvement um, approach where you need to work with your suppliers because you're going to be there for a while as long as they're willing to engage meaningfully and sometimes they won't. Uh, the vertical, in vertical integration is a big one and Dave, I don't know if you have, just in terms of how we structured our business throughout the years being so big. <laughs> so by comparison, we have 267,000 employees in our own operations, 300, roughly 300 manufacturing plants across the world, about 4,000 different facilities outside of that. So that's just what we own. Mm. I, I'm not sure what the kicker would be as you go to suppliers, to people just within our broader value chain would easily be in the billions. It's a good question though, because yeah, there are, um, you know, if you could control it all, you could drive standards all the way through, right? And this conversation that we're having today is essentially one that, that used to be just applied to, you know, company operations. What are you doing within your own four walls to take care of your workers, treat them well, give them fair wages, et cetera. And the conversations got much broader. So as companies get farther down into the supply chain and drive those standards and demand it contractually from a business uh, perspective, there can be a positive uh, to that at the end of the day. I know at least in some of, the, some of the countries where we go bring a business, we expand into the market, we bring farming technologies yep. that produce essentially greater crop yield, which is more economic benefit to the local farmer. We can also bring hygiene technologies and frankly, uh, farmer safety uh, technologies, irrigation uh, technologies and know-how. So there can be a positive to driving, you know, standards down, but also, you know, ideas, concepts, et cetera, even outside of control, but you certainly have influence even if you don't have control. And I think this conversation's a little bit about how do you, in the absence of hard law and requirements, how, how, how do the, the, the folks at the top of the supply chain keep driving down and how do you make the folks higher up in the, in the supply chain appreciate that that's got a value to it whether reactively because you don't want the consumers to run away from your products or deal with a crisis, but how do you actually create a more sustainable supply chain? We're really talking about how do you strengthen it and how do you build a framework that actually drives it down? And, and is, it, is it the norm? And I want to flip to the audience here for any questions in just a second, but is there a thought about what, what would a framework look like, five or ten? Where, where do we want to go? Because there's some soft norms, there's a possible you know, codification, in treaties about the UN guiding principles, but what do we envision absence full integration of a supply chain where you can control it all and drive your standards down? Is there a framework or is it just too hard to, to think about? It's a general question I'm looking at you just because I know you study broadly frameworks and stuff. But well, I, you know, I can tell you that. Um, or, or, or is there some convergence? And I'm gonna put yeah. up your slide right now just on, oh, okay. on the theory. So, I mean, if I'm making product for Nike, there are, there are countries they tell us we are not allowed to manufacture in, okay? They don't want to be in Bangladesh, they don't want to be in Cambodia, they don't want to be in Egypt. There are countries they don't want to be in, mostly because 
of these are higher risks in supply chain, whether it's in wages, whether it's in harassment, whether it's in uh, freedom of association. So, you know, those brands tell us we're not allowed to. They're telling us that for good reason. Their history there. Um, but uh, the other flip side is that I would say the average number of years outer stuff is in a factory is around 10 years. So, uh, that is one of the lessons that we've learned to drive change, to drive engagement and commitment. The prices may not be the best for the, for the factory, but this season, you know, I'm, we'll give you those nickels and dimes and quarters, um, but next season, uh, so it's like a trade-off. You know, this is 2,000 workers in, in a factory, and, but we want to be there. They've, they've committed to doing what's right both from the human rights, um, both from the environmental, safety, uh, social, and the governance part. And our markups may not be generally that great, that Blackstone is really happy about. But it's more important we don't do cost grazing. When I teach human rights, I call it cost grazing, where you let the cow out in the field, and they're going to go from whatever pasture they could find to get the food. Well. Those cows are my sourcing managers in my company, where they're just roaming around trying to get the best price. Okay, so just as an example, uh, it's hard to read the bottom, but this is interesting. I, I quickly did this yesterday. We have PepsiCo, a huge multi, uh, a multi-national um, company of 64 billion, and here's outer stuff. 350 million. One's public, one's private. The number of employees. Huge difference, 267,000 to 250. Um, Pepsi has a lot of brands. I only listed 22 because those are the billion dollar brands. Those are the, these are ours. And the countries sold in. We sell in 12 countries, they sell in hundreds. Um, the number of suppliers, the number of offices overseas. But there is one thing that we align on. As different as we are in companies, it is our codes of conduct and how we manage and vet them. So this is right off the Pepsi CSR report, which is basically word for word in my outer stuff report. Accountability for supplier code of conduct, engaging through code training, reviewing of CSR risks, improvement through third party audit and corrective management. Now this is a 35,000 foot look at a CSR program, and it goes to many, 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 many layers. But I'm encouraged to know that the program we have at Outer Stuff is in, in alignment with Pepsi, a world leader. So there, again, there are many layers underneath here, but that was interesting maybe, to maybe say. The frameworks are converging at the end of the day, even in the absence of uh, in international law that everybody's required, that there's some convergence. I'm curious from the audience, just who has factored, I mean, think about your own buying decisions and, and the things that you buy, whether it's a car, a TV, uh, and a uh, piece of apparel, a food or beverage product, which are typically more local, but think about your own buying decisions. Have you factored in anything or ever asked yourself, just to show a hand, it's like where it came from? Is that a factor in your... So, I mean, folks, uh, you, you're thinking about this from a consumer perspective. Um, it's curious to me, and so that's a very compelling thing. And, uh, and Sarah appropriately mentioned earlier, I'm curious, you know, relative to if you had your option of companies to go work for, would you want to work for a company that actually you know, articulates the standards that Nathan was just reviewing and holds their supply chain accountable for more than just cost and availability? Or would you work for a company that you know has either apathy in that regard or that cares? I mean, do you care as an employee that your company actually does the right thing? And that's a rhetorical question because I'm sure everybody cares. But um, any questions uh, from anyone uh, in the group? And there's a microphone right in the back, which uh, will allow everybody to hear your question. Thank you. Um, to that, what I was thinking is, is that I find this most obviously apparent in the food industry, where I study, is this non-GMO, is this organic, is this certified by the Oregon Tith, is this fair trade chocolate? I mean, there are symbols and um, representations on these products that let me know where they are because it's, it just seems so important um, from a food consumer point of view. But yet, I'll go into a restaurant and it's you know, not something that I'm considering. 
And then similarly, I, th I think the issue though then to your question is, would you rather work for a company 